Hello and welcome to the CX Files for 18th August 2022. My name is Mark Hillary and I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Mark, greetings from Montreal, Quebec. I'm Peter Ryan and it's great to be with you for what I think promises to be a fascinating interview today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're talking about travel this week. And of course, um, there's something in the news all the time at the moment. I know you've had your own travel nightmares recently, but, but I was listening to the radio earlier today and I heard um, Michael O'Leary, the chief executive of Ryanair, um, a favorite brand of yours, I guess. No relation, <laughs> no relation. I take no responsibility. He was almost ranting. I mean, I was listening to the radio and thinking, this is unbelievable. You know, an airline chief executive, and he was calling the uh, the executives of airports like Heathrow in London completely incompetent. You know, and, and you don't often hear a CEO talking this way. No, you don't. And to be perfectly honest with you, I think that all stakeholders in the travel ecosystem, the air travel ecosystem, are going to need to be held to account uh, over the course of the, the past six months, the poor planning, the poor execution. Uh, passengers have been put through trauma, uh, if not put through hell, over the course of the past two or three weeks or two or three months especially. And I know that there's been a lot of good news stories, Mark, like your family visit to the UK, but equally speaking, there have been a lot of uh, major, major mishaps that I don't think that the customer community are going to forget anytime soon. And I, I fully expect that lawmakers are going to start holding investigations in terms of what's happened and why did it happen? Yeah, so this week we're going to get a sort of inside track on the travel industry because we're talking to Simon Yoxon Graham, the chief executive of TLS Contact. Um, the TLS, uh, well known in the travel industry, they, they basically take over visa and consular services. Um, you know, traditionally it's been governments themselves that issue their travel visas, um, but, but increasingly many, many governments and embassies and, and consulates um, have been outsourcing these services um, to try and professionalize the entire, this part of the travel industry. Um, so I'm sure that you've had some, some discussion uh, and seen what TLS are doing, Peter. Many times. In fact, I, I actually know people that have availed themselves of using TLS as service in different countries, and it's been the height of professionalism. It's been extremely efficient. And quite frankly, I think it takes a lot of the pressure off many of the public sector agencies that are responsible for processing visas. And, you know, Mark, when we take a look at some of the horror stories that we've been hearing about how long it takes visas to get processed for certain countries, uh, when we hear about the, the the hassle that a lot of people have been having just looking in Canada, passport processing has been a nightmare in certain cities. It's, it's led to violence and police interventions uh, because the government uh, was not able to get the job done. It makes you think that outsourcing at least some degree of these processes to a private sector or agency that can handle it with efficiency and professionalism really counts for a lot. And this is why I think it's great to get Simon on the line today and to find out a little bit more about the TLS story and about what TLS has been able to bring to the broader discussion when it comes to some of these elements around travel that people up until recently have taken for granted and now have been seen as a source of stress. Yeah, it's a great interview. Um, he's got some interesting points. And, you know, he came into the business about three years ago. So he actually had about six months uh, as the CEO where he launched a big transformation program, trying to take you know, what was essentially a business that was just shifting bits of paper all over the place uh, and trying to drag it into the digital age. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and everybody stopped traveling. So of course, everything just changed overnight. So there's also a great kind of um, uh, transformation story going on in parallel with the sort of management of the pandemic. Why don't we go straight to the uh, the interview with Simon then and hear about uh, the TLS experience through the pandemic and beyond. Let's go for it. Simon, it's great to get you on the podcast. I've been following yourself um, and Gabrielle from, from TLS, you know, throughout the pandemic, uh, talking about some of the problems in the business. Now, you know, you're focused on visas and consular services, um, which clearly was affected dramatically by the pandemic. So, so how did you change in, with this or how did you deal with this sudden change in the travel industry during this tough time? 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. Great question. And thanks for having me on. I've listened to a, a number of the podcasts and absolutely love them. Um, so great to be on. Really good question. And the, the honest response is probably the same as you'll get from most organizations. No one was ready for something of this kind of size and scale. So although we were very well planned in terms of our business continuity disaster recovery, who could have ever predicted that there would be a global pandemic? However, because of some of the work that we've done pre-pandemic on building the infrastructure around the organization, we put ourselves in a good position to deal with some of the challenges that we faced. But for us, the challenge really started very early on because, as you know, a big part of our business is based out of China. And China was the first area to get hit with the pandemic. So in Q1 2020, we started to see the impact on volume and on interactions in China. And we immediately started to track the impact of the pandemic, both in China and a potential for it to impact outside of China as well. And one of the, the areas that really helped us with this is, or two actually, one was the relationship we have with our clients. And the second was the information that was being provided by teleperformance and all the services who had done a fantastic job of getting to grips with what was happening around the world uh, and helped us come up with a plan of how to deal with some of the challenges that we were going to face. So we immediately put in place safety measures in China um, to protect staff and applicants. And we implemented a number of things. Firstly, we mobilized an internal task force to enable us to respond quickly. And that become more and more useful as we started to see the impact outside of China, you know, next was Southeast Asia. And then all of a sudden it was the world. Um, we created processes to ensure all the face-to-face -face interactions were as safe as they could be. Uh, and they were things like use of PPE, which I'm sure you remember at the time was an absolute nightmare and, we, and no one could get hold of any. But again, because of the relationship uh, with organizations around the world and the support of teleperformance, we managed to get PPE for our staff, protect them and protect the applicants. We put up Perspex screens so there was limited contact between applicants and, uh, and uh, the, the employees, again, without losing that kind of interaction because the face-to-face -face interaction is important. We did temperature checks with everyone coming into the building, whether that be employees or applicants. We had regular testing for our employees. And then at, at the same time, we put in place clear protocols and steps to take if you were having any symptoms. So it was all about protecting our people. We did all sorts of stuff around how we would protect them. But that was our immediate response and had to be our immediate response. And we very quickly based everything we did in three things uh, or three areas. First was supporting our clients. Second was protecting our applicants. And third was protecting and supporting our employees. And every single decision we made right throughout the pandemic was underpinned by those three things. What that meant was that everyone in the organization had a clear view on how we were trying to deal with what was a very difficult and evolving scenario, but as challenging a situation as you can ever imagine to, to, to be in, especially given I'd only been in the CEO spot for about six months. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask you about, because you came into the business three years ago, or started leading the business three years ago, um, and you announced some big transformation plans just as you came in. Um, I mean, how, how did that go? Uh, uh, did you have to accelerate things or were your plans completely changed because of COVID? Well, as you can imagine, COVID kind of threw things up in the air uh, and it was a case of trying to juggle as many things as we possibly could. But yes, when I joined the organization in 2019, it was clear to me and it was clear to the leadership of Teleperformance that the organization needed to go through a transformation. Now, we need to be careful here because, and I'm very careful about how I talk about this, because the business had been really successful and it had grown really well. The team had developed considerably, but they'd grown really fast. And in my view, what had happened is the business had outgrown itself. So there was so much business and so much success that the infrastructure just was not in place to, to deal with uh, the next evolution of the organization. So we very quickly started to work on how we needed to rebuild that infrastructure to support the next phase of growth within the organization. But the biggest issue for me was culture. So it felt really hierarchical. There was a real lack of transparency, no clear strategic objectives for anyone. So no one was aligned by you know, clear shared goals. 
And probably the thing that was most surprising to me was there was no clear mission, vision, or purpose, which in a modern organization, I think puts you at a disadvantage. So very quickly, we, we got focused on aligning people behind strategic objectives, because I believe that if you keep, give people purpose, if you can paint a vivid vision of a successful future, then you can focus on the process. You don't have to focus on the outcomes. Um, if you attach your success to only outcomes, um, which are vital uh, for all of us, uh, then your identity becomes all about those outcomes. And I think you've got to be really careful. The outcomes are a byproduct of your efforts and your execution of the process. So we were very much focused on every step we needed to take to improve the organization. So we very quickly implemented a vision, a mission, and a purpose. And we also created shared strategic object objectives for everyone right across the organization to align behind. And it was staggering how quickly people aligned behind those uh, objectives and started pushing us in the right direction. And pre-COVID, so within the first six, eight months of me being there, you were already seeing a shift in culture, a shift in way pe the way people interacted with each other. We'd squashed the hierarchy quite considerably. And what was happening was there was more interactions. And I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to create opportunities for interactions with everyone right across the organization and then make those interactions as normal as possible. I want people in every area of the business to be able to talk to anyone else in the organization, no matter what your title is, no matter what you do, what your responsibilities are. I work on the premise that I have a list of things that I need to get done in a day. You also have a list of things that you need to get done in a day. My list is no more important than yours, and that applies to everyone in the organization. And when you base the way you work and your culture in that as a fundamental um, pillar, then what you tend to find is you get more openness, you get more honesty. And I get a clearer picture of what's going on around the organization. And all of that happened very quickly because change, you can push change to happen quickly. But what we also knew is when the pandemic started, we really didn't know what the impact would be, but we knew there would be impact. And what we've actually found is, although there has been a slowdown in some areas like technology development and digitization, there has been an acceleration in the cultural shift. And one of my biggest learnings from the pandemic is that sometimes cultural change can be helped by a crisis because what happens is everyone aligns behind shared objectives, behind each other, and then pulls in the same direction to achieve a shared goal. And a shared goal is to get past that crisis. And what's that that's done in our organization is really galvanized the team and accelerated a lot of that cultural change. We've also continued to shift um, in terms of digital transformation as well, which is really important for not only TLS, but also our industry. Uh, but as you can imagine, that's always challenging in an environment like we're in, where you know, travel was taken to zero overnight, uh, and there is a massive financial impact on not only us, but also our clients. So we've pushed that as hard as we possibly can, but certainly a challenging environment. Well, and you've got quite a a detailed insight into the travel industry. I mean, clearly, you know, you're, you're giving people um, visas to travel. Um, so are you seeing any kind of trends or insights from, from inside, deep inside the industry um, that we're not hearing on the, uh, you know, the business radio shows and the business journals? Yeah, everyone's got an opinion on this, Mark, but no one really knows what's going to happen. The, the reality is, is that uh, nothing is clear. So, we have data, we have statistics, we have relationship with, relationships with clients uh, and key uh, market uh, kind of knowledge bases, but no one really knows what's going to happen. What we're seeing right now is that travel is returning around the world everywhere other than Russia and China. So China is driven by the COVID restrictions, which have just been adjusted slightly, but still are very restrictive, which means that there's not a lot of travel out of China and into China. Uh, and then obviously the other area is Russia due to the conflict in Ukraine. So there are limited visas being issued in both China and Russia. However, elsewhere in the world, we're seeing different things. So for example, in Northern Africa, we're seeing a return to volume, but not as much volume as we've seen pre-pandemic. Whereas in sub-Saharan Africa, we're seeing an acceleration in volume and we're back ahead of pre-pandemic volumes. So there's a real kind of shift in the way the world is traveling. Uh, and 
the one thing that we we find really difficult to do is look out into the future, look six months, 12 months out into the future and really predict what's going to happen. And I think that's mainly driven by a couple of things. One is the potential resurgence of COVID, which we keep getting news of. Uh, you know, there's, there's new pockets around the world and, and governments are looking to react to that. Apprehension around travel. There's still quite a bit of that as well. People are not entirely clear about how safe it is to get on a plane. Um, airline understaffing is also a massive issue. You know, we, we're hearing about that a lot in the news these days. Economic instability uh, is also playing a, a, a part. So things like the cost of living increase means there's less disposable income, which means peace, people have less money to spend on travel. Uh, and we also have the unknown impact of the high inflation around the world as well. We have a shift to remote working and less face-to-face -face interactions, which I think is starting to shift back to a certain extent, but certainly not where it was pre-pandemic. And then you also have the counter to that, which is revenge travel. So what we're seeing now is the airlines and travel companies struggling because they didn't predict that there was going to be such an aggressive return to social travel, if you like, uh, in the summer. And since Easter, we've seen some real challenges with airlines. So there's so many variables. There's so many things to predict. It's really difficult to put your finger on something and say, okay, that's going to drive us back to pre-pandemic levels. And it's even more difficult when you're a global organization and you have, uh, you have service delivery all around the world. But we're seeing definitely some positive signs. So um, you were saying there about the changes in the industry, but have the customer expectations changed? I mean, are they seeing, uh, they asking for different ways to interact or different channels, or are you using more automation or anything else then? Yeah, we're, do we're doing all the things that you should be doing in, in, a, in an industry that has been starved of digitization for many years. So uh, even since, you know, the three years that I've been involved in, and before that as well, we've been shifting to a certain extent away from an entirely paper-based solution to um, a part digitized solution because the, the government, unfortunately, are not quite ready for full digitization at this stage. Uh, however, we have made some steps towards that. But I don't believe that expectations have changed dramatically throughout um, the COVID period. Expectations are high. They always have been high. Uh, and the one thing that has changed is people's view on how this, the service would be delivered in the future much more of an appetite for things like innovation and digitization down the line, but there's just a long way to go until we get there. Now, what we've done back in 2019 is we shifted from selling based on uh, output, selling based on uh, applications processed to selling based on value. So we got much more focused on outcomes as opposed to outcomes of, of a process, as opposed to how many applications can we process in a day? So, we changed the way we interact with clients and what we've seen is a shift in what our clients are now expecting from external third party suppliers. And obviously we welcome that change because we know that we can deliver value to our clients. We also know that there are other companies in this space that can do things cheaper than us. And that's always gonna be the case, no matter what industry you're in, someone's gonna come in and be able to do it cheaper. But we know that what they can't deliver at the same level as of value as us. So as long as we can drive the clients to be looking for value and looking at the right type of value, then we're in a strong position to put ourselves ahead of the rest of the, uh, the industry uh, and win business. And that, that is definitely manifesting itself now. Part of that is introducing new channels to interact with our clients, not only our government clients, but also the applicants. How can we better service their needs in a digitized environments in the future? How can we utilize automation? And we're in, a, again, we're in a great spot being part of teleperformance. They are the masters of automation. Uh, and we have lots of things that we can do for our clients in the future that, that we would like to bring on board. But there's also other things that we can do for our clients, like looking at their internal processes and looking for ways that we can add value at their end, as opposed to just add value in the service that we provide for them as well. That's a part that certainly takes a bit of work because we've got to get under the skin of our clients. Um, but it's something that we're definitely committed to. And um, one of the things that has definitely improved during the pandemic is our relationships with our clients. We are close to our clients now than we have ever been. And the reason we're close to them is because we've been transparent, we've been open, and we've been committed to delivering against all of our commitments right the way through the pandemic. And that's something that the clients obviously uh, really appreciated during the most challenging time they'll ever have to deal with.
yeah, obviously that's that's exactly when they need a partner. I mean, have you seen um, a, a recovery in travel generally then? Because you're monitoring the, the applicants, are you seeing a difference in the applicants for leisure travel and, and business travel? Is, is that recovering differently? Yeah, I, I think, and again, it's, it's pretty consistent with what you'll, you'll hear in the, you know, in the, the business pages or reading the business pages or, or the business news. That leisure travel is recovering. You're seeing it now, as I said before, we, we know we're seeing pressure on airlines all around the world. It's not just the airlines in the UK, it's airlines elsewhere as well, because there is an increase in leisure travel. Uh, and I have no doubts that that will re return to pre-pandemic levels. The question is only how long it takes uh, and when that happens. And uh, no one can tell you that. But we are certainly seeing an acceleration in leisure travel uh, throughout the summer. And I expect that continue to continue throughout the year. Business travel, I think, is a little bit different. And I think it'll take longer to recover uh, and I don't know whether it will ever be the same as it was before. Now, that doesn't mean it won't be the same volume, but I just don't think it will be the same as it was pre-pandemic. It will look different. Even if I just look at our own organization, we found ways of becoming much more efficient remotely. So this doesn't remove the need for face-to-face -face interactions, but it certainly means that it changes your thought process when you're, you're planning a face-to-face -face meeting. Can we do this remotely? Can we be effective remotely? And because businesses have spent a couple of years getting to grips with that as a reality, they've become much more effective. So I, I think in the kind of short to midterm, you will see more remote interactions. And then eventually, I think what we will see is a return to face-to-face -face interactions uh, in the future, but certainly business will recover. In my view, business travel will recover slower than, uh, than leisure travel. And so finally then, I mean, just to wrap up, what, what changes uh, are on the road ahead for you and TLS? I mean, you, you've talked about a digital approach to the uh, the service, um, but what, what kind of transformation do you see happening over the next year or two then? Yeah, so so this is one of the areas where the pandemic has had a real impact. So pre-pandemic, we were pushing really hard for governments to look at real digital transformation because here's the reality, Mark, in our industry, we haven't gone through real digital transformation yet. What we've done is we've taken a paper-based process and then we've digitized parts of it. We haven't actually gone back, right back to the start, stripped it back and built a digital process. Um, and that's a, a comment about the industry, not about, about TLS. And I think there's a lot of work to, to be done there. I think governments look at it and, and know that they have to take steps to digitize because it delivers efficiency. Uh, and it means that we can actually process more applications quicker help them get through their processes quicker as well. So there are lots of benefits, including the fact that it can be more cost effective. But digital transformation is spoken about within governments, but I don't see a massive amount of actual execution. I think that will come down the line and I think that will accelerate now in, an, in the next couple of years. But I, I, and, and I, re, I think that is driven by the fact that governments were shocked by how reliant they were on the face-to-face -face interactions during the pandemic. So when they went away, all of a sudden they realize that without those face-to-face -face interactions, they don't really have a service. It looks very different. They can't keep travel going without those interactions. And the majority of that is driven by the fact that we have to collect biometrics. It's a curated journey. And we take people through the process. There's a face-to-face -face interaction there that needs to happen. But things will change in the future. Technology will improve. Government's attitude to technology will change as well. Uh, and we know that the requirements around things like biometric capture will change in the coming years. Um, this has drove governments to be more creative in the way they look at the solutions and start to explore the possibilities of remote um, biometric capture. Uh, things like digital documents upload has become the norm in some areas of the world now for, uh, for visa processing. But in others, you'd be surprised it's not. It's an entirely paper-based process and someone comes into the back with a, a ream of paper and then you have to go through it all and, and help them get that into a place where they can submit it. But there's still a long way to go before we get to a stage where we are, uh, we are looking similar to things like banking, where they've gone through a full digital transformation and it looks very different. And one of the main drivers behind that is physical and cyber security is still the number one priority for our clients. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, this makes the shift to real digitization a little bit more complicated, um, but no doubt it will happen at some point in the future. We're seeing now, 
new tenders and new requests for proposal uh, looking for much more digitization. So when you look three, five, 10 years down the line, it will become the norm. Again, the thing that is really difficult to do is put your finger on when that's going to happen because there's an awful lot of things that need to fall into place before you can deliver true digitization into an, an industry like ours. All right, Simon, that's a great update. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week. Uh, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I was just going to wait just a moment. There's a protest outside. My oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We can do it now, yeah.